So we were working on number five on worksheet 18. Um, we were talking about moment of inertia. Again, moment of inertia is how hard it is to rotate an object. Okay. So for example, you have um, this object. Let's, for example, let's say dumbbell that has mass on two sides of the rod. Okay, you have this configuration, and you also have same rod, but let's say the masses are a little bit closer to the center. So same rod, same mass, same center, but the two masses are a little bit closer in this case. So which one do you think would be harder to rotate? This one be harder to rotate? Or this one? Really? Think about it twice. You have a dumbbell which has like masses at the ends, and the one that has the masses near the center. If you do the experiment, it will be harder to rotate this one compared to this one. Okay. The reason is that this one has greater moment of inertia. So the moment of inertia depends on this distance, distance of the mass from the center. Greater the distance, greater is the moment of inertia. Greater the moment of inertia, harder it is to rotate. Okay. Uh, you might have seen this in uh, ice skating. So when the ice skaters um, fold their arms, they can easily rotate, okay, compared to when their arms are uh, extended. So in this case, it's hard. They, so they, they rotate pretty fast in this case when they uh, fold their arms because this one has uh, low moment of inertia. In the um, extended arm, there is um, high moment of inertia. Okay. High moment of inertia means harder to rotate. So that's the idea be behind moment of inertia. So, Moment of inertia depends on which axis you choose. Okay, so we saw last time the configuration with four masses, with the axis passing through the center of the square. That's part A, and then part B, uh, we uh, calculated the moment of inertia for the axis of rotation passing through the sides of the square. So in the first problem, that's the axis of rotation. Okay. In the second problem, the uh, second part, that's the axis of rotation. So you are rotating So you're rotating the square in this axis like that, okay? Here you're rotating like that. So so if this is the plane, in the first part, you're rotating at the center of this configuration like that, okay? It's hard to show, but you're rotating like that. So center of the square is the axis. In the second one, so you're rotating like this. So this line is the axis of rotation. You're rotating like that. Now for part C, the axis passes through the center of the upper left and lower right sphere. So for the third one, axis is the diagonal of the sphere or, or of the uh, square. 
So that's the axis now. So you're rotating like that. So this diagonal is the axis you're rotating like that now. So for that, we want to find the moment of inertia. And the moment of inertia is the product of mass times distance from perpendicular distance from the axis. Okay, so mass one, let's call this one, two, three, and four. So mass times distance from the axis squared, mass two, and its distance from the axis squared, mass three, and its distance from the axis squared, and mass four, distance from the axis squared. So let's see if someone has a question. Can you do part B again on number five? Last class, your screen was black. Okay, so let's do uh, number uh, part B first before we do this. Uh, le or, or let's do this one and then we'll go back to part B. Okay, let's let's complete this one first and then we'll go back to part B. So masses are all same, so we can just denote masses by m and pull it outside the parentheses. So R1 squared plus R2 squared plus R, this is part C, R3 squared plus R4 squared. So mass of the object or spheres, 0 0.200 kilogram. Now R1, what's R1? Distance of this first mass from this axis, what's that distance? Zero, yeah, it's exactly on the axis, so this is zero. Plus R2, R2 is the distance of this mass and this axis, and we are calculating the, we are considering the perpendicular distance, okay, so this distance. So how do you find, how do you find that distance? This is a right triangle. Or you can find diagonal and take half of that. Or, so this is a right triangle. So this is, did we consider this side to be 0.4 or 0.2? Because there was inconsistency in the, okay. So let's consider this to be 0.4. So 0.4 meter, and this is, uh, Diagonal and that's diagonal, so we can. So point four. So using the Pythagoras theorem, so that squared is this side squared. Let's call that A. Let's call that B. And A and B would be same because they are both half of the diagonal. So A squared, B squared. B squared is also A squared because they are same. Okay. So zero point four zero zero squared is equal to 2a squared and a squared is 0 0.400 squared over 2 and then a is square root of 0 0.400 squared over 2 or you can just write this so 0 0.400 squared and square root you can cancel. So that's 0 0.400 over square root of two. 0 .4 .0 .4 .0 .4 .0 so let's calculate that and see what you get. 0 0.400 over square root of two. And then you um, replace this R2 by that.
what did you get for this one? Point, huh? Point three? Exactly point three? Point two eight or point two nine, okay. Point two eight two. Point two eight two. Okay, so 0 0.282 meter squared. And then R3, this mass is exactly on the axis, so that means R3 is also zero. And R4 is also half of the diagonal, so exactly same distance, so 0 0.282 squared. Okay, and you do the calculation, that would be the moment of inertia about this diagonal axis. So this is in kilogram meter squared. Now let's look at part B. So again, moment of inertia about this axis is mass times, the mass is same, so I'm pulling it outside the parenthesis. R1 squared plus R2 squared plus R3 squared plus R4 squared, 0 0.200 kilogram, R1. So what's the distance between R1 and the axis? This distance, perpendicular distance. It's half of the length, so 0 0.200 meter squared. What's the distance between R2 and uh, axis? That's also 0 0.200 meters squared. Distance between the axis and 3 is also same. And distance between this fourth sphere and the axis is also same. Okay. So 0 0.200 kilogram. So all these are same, so this would be four times 0 0.200 squared, okay? So do the math, that will give you the moment of inertia in kilogram meter squared. So different objects have different moment of inertia. Yes. Yeah, so you can get same number sometimes. Yeah. It's not uncommon. So sometimes different axes may have same moment of inertia. They may also be different, so uh, yeah, it may or may not be same. Um, so different objects have different moment of inertia. Uh, we saw how to find the moment of inertia for these individual masses, but sometimes we may have solid objects, okay? Something like um, a rod, a cylindrical rod, or a sphere, or a disc. So in those masses, it's a bit difficult to find moment of inertia in this way. So you need to use calculus, okay? Which is beyond our scope of this course. So I'm gonna give you the formula to find the moment of inertia of different kinds of objects without showing the derivation of how to find the formula. So here is the moment of inertia for different objects. So if you have a thin rod, rectangular rod, okay, like here, and if you pass the axis through the middle point of the rod, then its moment of inertia would be given by 1 12th ml squared, okay, mass times length of this rod squared. If, you, if the axis of rotation is on the edge, like here, then it would be 1 third ml squared. Again, moment of inertia depends on where your axis of rotation is. In this case, 
If it is from the, if it is through the center, it's one twelfth ml squared. If it is on the edge, then it's one third ml squared. If you have a this um, flat rectangular um, block or slab, then the moment of inertia about the center would be one twelfth one twelfth mass times um, side squared, the length squared. The length to, through which you pass the axis. Okay, so we consider this length in this formula. If the axis of rotation is on the edge, then it will be one third m a squared. Okay, again. So this middle one is you rotate like this, okay, passing the axis through the center, uh, the middle line, and the last one you rotate like this. So you are passing the axis through this edge, so you are rotating like this. Okay. And for a cylinder or a disk, the moment of inertia is one half m r squared. If you have a cylindrical hoop okay, with the hollow, hollow uh, inner part, it's m r squared. Considering the axis of rotation to be passing through the center. You may also have axis of rotation passing through the, this uh, surface. Okay? In that case, the moment of energy should be different. So let's say this is the cylinder. You may rotate this cylinder through the axis, pass uh, through the central axis, or you can also um, rotate this with the axis on its surface, like that. Okay? So here, if you do that, the axis is on the surface. Uh, you may have a sphere, sphere with the central axis. It's 2 fifth MR squared. If you have a sphere, a uh, shell, hollow sphere, this is solid sphere. This bottom one is hollow sphere. For hollow sphere, it's 2 third MR squared. So we'll be using these um, formulas to do some problems. So let's look at number six. So in this problem, we have a solid disk. And when you apply torque on this solid disk, the, the solid disk will rotate about the axis passing through the center. Okay, this, ax, this is the axis of rotation. So when the disk pa um, rotates about this axis, its moment of inertia is given by, so I is given by, see the formula. So this one, this is the disk. Okay? This is true for both disk and cylinder. Disk is the one that has very thin, thin um, uh, length. So it's m r squared. So one half m r squared is the moment of inertia. Okay. So you are applying a bunch of forces, one force in this direction. Next force. in this direction at angle of 40 degrees. And the next one you're applying at this direction. So call that F1, F2, and F3. So each of the forces tend to produce torque. And when you apply torque, there is, ang uh, there is acceleration, angular acceleration. And we know sum of torque is equal to I alpha. Okay, this is from Newton's second law. So Newton's second law is F is equal to MA. This is for the linear motion. For angular motion, force is torque, mass is I, and acceleration is alpha. Okay, so that's Newton's 
second law for rotational motion. Okay. So here our purpose is to find alpha. So we can use this equation to find that. So let's sum all the torques. What's the torque produced by this first, uh, first force? If you apply force down towards the center, will that produce any rotation? Imagine you're pushing the disc this way. Will the disc rotate? No, it won't rotate because you're applying the force exactly at the pivot. When you apply the force at the pivot, it doesn't rotate. Okay? Even thinking from your experience, you can say that there's no rotation for um, force one. Okay? So force one, sum of torque is force one times R one sum of uh, the, the torque due to force two is F2. Here, let me write also. This is the actual formula for the torque. Torque is force times distance times sine theta. So this is the torque for the first one. Torque for second force is F2 R2 sine theta two plus F3 R3 sine theta three, okay, that's the sum of the torques, and that is equal to I times alpha, okay. So here, distance would be zero, because we are applying the force exactly at the pivot, so that's zero, there's no rotation produced by that. Now F2, F2 is 14.6 Newton. And distance between the point where we apply the force and the axis of rotation. So this distance between this point and the center. So that's distance R2 which is the radius of the disc, 0 0.350 meters. And what's the angle between this distance and the force? So it's 40 degrees, right? So this, this line and this force, 40 degrees, sine 40 degrees. And then you also need to decide whether it produces clockwise rotation or counterclockwise rotation. So when you pull this disc this way, it tends to rotate this way, right? Is that right? Or will it rotate this way? So you have a disc, if you pull it this way, yeah, it'll, it'll move clockwise, it will rotate it clockwise. So clockwise means it's negative clockwise is negative. Now, torque produced by the third force, F3, F3 is 8.5 Newton. And the distance between the pivot, which is the center, and the force, again, is radius. So that's the distance R3, which is also 0 0.350 meters. And then what's the angle between this distance and this distance and this force. It's 90 degrees, yes. So 90 degrees, okay. So that is equal to I alpha O and we also need to <coughs> decide whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise. So if you push this disc up, if you push this way, will the rotation be clockwise or counterclockwise? It's counterclockwise, so counterclockwise 
is positive. Okay. So we have this number. So calculate this number. Can you do that? 14.6 times 0 0.350 times sine 40. So what is that? Fourteen point six times point three five zero sine forty three point two eight. So that's negative three point two eight. The unit for torque is is the product of force and meter uh, distance. And then the next one is eight point five times point three five sine 90 is 1. Oh, this is not giving the number. Can you guys tell me the number? It's showing the fraction. 2.9? 2.98 Newton meter. Okay. I, so I is given by this formula. So 1 half mass of that disc, 1.5 kilogram, radius 0 0.350 squared times alpha. You got 0 0.38 for the first one. Okay, maybe that's point three eight. Maybe I got it wrong. Did you guys get point three eight or point three two eight in this one? Is that what you got? Okay, I don't know. So, uh, so, okay. So Cooper, you want to, yeah, check it again. So. Now everything is known here except alpha. So basically, it's just doing the math. So add these two numbers and then multiply by two and then divide by this thing. So that'll give you alpha. Okay. So let's do that. Tell me the answer once you figure out the answer. So the unit for alpha is radian per second squared. Did you guys have 3.32? Negative 3.32. Okay. So this negative implies that it's slowing down or it's, uh, it could have two meanings. One is slowing down or it could also mean it's moving in um, clockwise direction. No, this one, did you find for, now for the, cal just for the calculation, yeah, you don't need to change it to radian. You can just leave it in degrees because you are not plugging in the numbers in sine or cosine. So you can just leave, uh, leave the degree mode. Okay, so that's, Worksheet 18. Now let's look at now worksheet 19. But before 
we start worksheet 19. One more thing I would like to point out here, very important concept. So when you roll something, like for example a disk, consider a disk rolling on a surface. So the rolling motion of that disk is combination of two types of motion. One is translational motion. So you see this disk is moving from left to right. Okay, it's moving this way. So that's translational motion. So you can focus on this central point. So initially the disk was somewhere here. Okay, oops. And that's the central point. So the central point is just moving along this line. So that's the translational motion. And also this disk is rotating okay, along this line, along this line. So there is also rotation. So when something rolls on some surface, it's the combination of rotational motion and translational motion. And often we deal with the case where the object is not slipping on the surface. Okay? It's rotating on the surface but without slipping. Okay? So if you have a disk like this, it's not slipping like that. It's just rotating in such a way that the bottom point touches the, the, the surface only at once. Okay? So for the case where the object rolls without slipping, it needs to satisfy this following condition. Okay? So again, all the problems that we will be doing from now on is where the object rolls without slipping. Okay? That's something you need to keep in mind. Now we want to find what's the condition for that. So here we have this disk, okay? and this disk is rolling on the surface without slipping. And the linear velocity, so again, this one has two motions. One is translational motion. Translational motion is denoted, denoted by this green arrow. It's showing how it is moving along this line, okay, this middle line. And it also has uh, rotational motion. Rotational motion is denoted by this, this, this blue, uh, blue curve. Okay. So initially, you, you have this point at this point, and when it's rolling, this point moves along this uh, curve. Okay? So this point will be here when the disk is here, and this point would be here when the disk is here. Okay? Again, this green arrow shows how it is translating, translating forward. And this uh, blue arrow shows how it is rotating. Now again, assume that the disk is not slipping. So um, consider that you wrap a piece of string on this disk. Okay. So when you rotate this, the, the, the string will uh, lay on the surface of this um, uh, on the surface of this table or something okay so by the time this point gets this point whole uh, piece of string would be on the surface okay on the surface this would be the whole piece of the string that we wrap around the disk which is the circumference of the circumference of the disk. Okay. So this distance from here to here is the circumference of the disk. So the distance traveled by this disk from this point to this point is delta x, that's the distance or displacement, which is given by v times delta t, that's the formula for 
velocity, velocity is delta x over delta t. So the distance traveled is v times delta t. Okay. And delta x distance traveled is circumference of the disk okay, because it traveled from here to here, which is one complete uh, rotation. And the circumference of the disk is 2 pi times r. That's the circumference. That means the distance travel is v times delta t from the usual formula. And that distance is 2 pi r, which is circumference. Okay. Now, from the definition of time period, we define time period. T is time period. Do you guys remember what's the definition of time period? Time period is time to complete one rotation. So in one rotation, what's the distance traveled by this point? Oops. What's the distance traveled by this point in one complete rotation? By the time it makes one complete rotation, what's the distance traveled by this, di this disk from here to here? 2 pi r, exactly, 2 pi r. So let's di um, divide both sides by capital T and capital T. So time for one complete rotation is capital T. So I divided both sides by capital T. And this delta x over t, okay, that's the definition of velocity. Okay, velocity is distance over time, which is 2 pi r over t. Okay, I'm just dividing both sides by t. Okay, so velocity of this whole disk, or you can say the center point in this forward direction, this velocity is 2 pi r over t. And previously we saw that 2 pi over t is omega. Okay, omega is angular velocity. So I showed you before angular velocity is given by 2 pi over t, which is omega. So we can replace this 2 pi over t by omega. Okay. So this v is omega times r. And that's the condition for rolling of this, rolling of this disk without slipping. Okay. This is a very important condition. We'll be using this all the time to solve the problem. So condition for rolling without slipping. Again, when it rolls without slipping, it covers distance of 2 pi r in one complete circle. In one complete circle, the time is delta t okay, to make one complete circle. This thing is the velocity of this disk in the forward direction, and this is omega r. Okay, so v is omega r. Sorry, what's that? That's the angular velocity. So, right, so here, let me uh, explain a little bit more on this one. So this V is, it's the translational velocity. The meaning of that is how fast this, this central point or this whole disk you can say is moving in the forward direction, okay, that's V. So, how fast the whole disk is 
moving forward. And this omega is rotational velocity, which is how fast the disk is rotating. So if the two velocities are related by this formula, then the disk is rotating without slipping. Okay. And we can also derive another formula for this one. I will not show the derivation, but I'll just write it here. So we can also write a is equal to alpha times r. Okay. So we need to do a little bit of calculus here to um, derive this formula. But this is also the derivation from this one, which is also, which could also be used for this condition when disk is rotating without slipping. So we have two conditions. for um, rotation of the object without slipping, either this one or this one. Okay. So now we will apply that to solve some of the problems. So let's look at uh, worksheet 19.1. So there is a sphere rotating down on, or rolling down on an inclined surface. So that's the sphere. So it's a bowling, bowling ball, which is a sphere. It's two kilogram. And the condition here is, this is rolling down without slipping. So that means whenever any object rolls down without slipping, the condition is omega uh, v is omega r or um, a is alpha r, okay? Rolling without slipping. Okay, so that's the condition. The ramp is inclined at 30 degrees, so that's 30 degrees, which is denoted by beta. What is the ball's acceleration? And what is the frictional force acting on the ball? Treat the ball as a uniform sphere. So this is a sphere. That means it's moment of inertia. It's moment of inertia is, let's see, what's the moment of inertia of the ball? Two fifth MR squared, okay, so. Here, so this is the moment of inertia of the ball, okay rotating about the center. So 2 fifth mr squared. Okay. So the first thing we want to do here is draw a free body diagram. Okay. So what forces we have here? The first force, this is the center of gravity where all the masses are concentrated. So the weight acts at the center of gravity, so that's the weight. And there is also normal force. What else we have? Hmm? Kinetic? What do you mean kinetic?
Yeah, that's a very good point. So you have friction. You, you are saying friction. But think about whether it's FK or FS. So this point touches this surface only once. Okay? And then once it rolls, the next point will touch the surface, and the next point will touch the surface. That means there is no relative motion between the surface and the surface and the, this uh, sphere. Okay, so this is not sliding along the surface. We are talking about rolling without slipping. That means it's not sliding. If it, if it slides on the surface, then the friction would be kinetic friction. But since it's not rolling without slip, it's, it's not uh, slipping, so here we need to consider static friction. Okay, so this friction would be static friction. Okay, because no relative motion between the sphere and the surface. Relative motion means like you have a block and some surface, so this block moves this way and this table moves that way, so there's this relative motion. Okay? In this case, you can use kinetic friction. But there's no relative motion. At, at the instance, the ball touches the surface, the, this point is at rest okay? for a very brief moment. And then the next point touches, and the next point will also, also be at for very, uh, for would be also be uh, for uh, rest for very brief time. Okay, and then next point, and the next point, next point. So there's no like movement between the two surfaces. So this is very important thing you need to keep in mind. So here we need to use uh, static friction, not kinetic friction. Okay, so we want to find um, acceleration so to find acceleration we need to use Newton's second law okay, for this ball so same thing we did last time like last time so all the forces along x direction all the forces along y direction and then we'll add the torque which would be I times alpha. So we are using Newton's second law for linear motion and for rotational motion. So what are the forces we have along x direction? So you may ask the question, which one is x direction before we figure out the forces? So which one should be x direction in this case? You should remember this from the last um, chapter, previous chapter. So usually when we have a surface like this, we choose the x-axis along the surface. Okay? That's what we have been doing. So our x-axis would be this. And perpendicular to that would be y-axis. So that would be y-axis. So and then the next rule is we choose the positive x to be along the direction in which the object is moving. So the object is moving down, so we choose this to be positive. Okay? So this would be negative x. And then we can choose this as positive y, that as negative y. Okay. So we are out of time. We'll continue this next time. Um, but uh, please finish worksheet 18 and submit that on grid scope. Once again, there is no lab today and tomorrow. We'll have a last lab next week. Okay, one more lab next week. If you guys have any question about homework or anything, you can come and talk with me during the lab time. You can utilize lab to discuss about homework questions.